Hi and welcome, I'm Gavin Lon. So we have achieved quite a bit at this point. We have successfully created code that allows the user to control the player. In this video, we are going to make the main camera follow the player game object. We are also going to make the player object jump in response to the user pressing the J character on the user's keyboard. We'll discuss why it is better to use the fixed update method for our physics related code rather than the update method. So, one quick way that we can make the camera follow the player game object is to make the main camera a child object of the parent player object. To do this, we can simply drag the main camera object under the player game object within the hierarchy window like this. So let's see what happens when we run the game. Okay, so that is definitely not what we want. The camera is rolling around with the player game object, which certainly creates a weird incoherent effect that just doesn't serve the game. So in order to get the main camera to appropriately follow the player object, as the player object moves on the ground plane through three dimensional space, we can write appropriate code within a C-sharp script that we can then add to our main camera game object. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. Please ring the bell so that you'll be notified about future content. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. If you're feeling generous and you'd like to buy me a coffee as a thank you, I've left a link in the description of this video to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage. It will of course be greatly appreciated. I love reading your comments so please feel free to engage with me in the comments section. To create our script, let's right click within the scripts folder and add a new C-sharp script to the scripts folder and let's name our script file camera follow. Let's double click the camera follow script in order to open the script within Visual Studio Code. So the first thing to do is to add a public field to the script file so that our code has a reference to the player game object. Notice that the player field is of the transform data type. You'll see a bit later, we are able to drag and drop the player game object from the hierarchy window into this player field within the Unity editor. So we can drag and drop the player object from the hierarchy window to the inspector window appropriately so that we have a reference to this player field and can access the player game object within our camera follow script. This will allow us to code the camera to follow the movements of the player object in three dimensional space. Let's create another public field of type vector3. Let's name this field offset. So in the last part of this course we briefly discussed what a three dimensional vector is. Let's recap. Basically a three dimensional vector represents direction and magnitude within three dimensional space. So in this context a vector is a single value made up of three values. Each of these values, x, y, and z, make up a single value that represents the direction in which an object is traveling and how far the object has traveled in three-dimensional space relative to another point in three-dimensional space. So a three-dimensional vector is made up of three values that can be represented as x, y, and z that represents direction and magnitude in three-dimensional space. The x value represents a point position on the x axis. The y value represents a point position on the y axis and the z value represents a point position on the z axis within three dimensional space. So the offset field is defined as a vector three data type. In order for the main camera to continuously follow the player game object in three dimensional space, we want the position of the camera represented as a three dimensional vector to be updated within the update loop so that the camera trails behind the player game object and dynamically films, as it were, the player's movement through three-dimensional space. We can do this by writing code to appropriately update the transform position of the camera in the update loop, where the camera's position changes in step with the player object's transform settings. Basically, this is done by updating the positional transform settings of the camera object to the player's position expressed as a vector, plus the offset, which is also expressed as a vector. 
So the code to achieve this is very basic. We simply write code that modifies the transform position of the camera appropriately by adding the three-dimensional positional values x, y, and z by the 3D x, y, and z vector stored in the offset field. Of course, by inserting this code within the update method, this code will execute once per frame, which will cause the camera position to appropriately update as the user controls the player movement through three-dimensional space. Note that we are able to simply use Unity's transform keyword here to reference the main camera's transform component. The reason we can simply write transform for this purpose is because the script we are currently writing is attached to the camera object. So Unity knows, as it were, that the transform keyword references the main camera's transform component. So in this code, we are adding the offset value to the player game object's position property. The offset value is a three-dimensional vector, and the player dot position value is also a three-dimensional vector. So what happens when one vector is added to another vector? This is actually very basic to understand. All that happens is the x value of the first vector operand is added to the x value of the second vector operand. The y value of the first vector operand is added to the y value of the second vector operand, and the z value of the first vector operand is added to the z value of the second vector operand. So let's say that the first vector operand has an x value equal to minus three, a y value equal to one, and a z value equal to 20. The second vector operand has an x value equal to zero, a y value equal to zero, and a z value equal to minus 10. The result of this mathematical calculation is as follows. The first vector operand is made up of these three dimensions. X is equal to minus three, Y is equal to one, Z is equal to 20, plus the second vector operand's three-dimensional value, which are X is equal to zero, Y is equal to zero, and Z is equal to minus 10. So the vector result of this calculation is X is equal to minus three, Y is equal to one, and Z is equal to 10. So let's say the first vector operand represents the transform position of the player and the second vector operand represents the offset value. And the result of the first vector operand plus the second vector operand is assigned to the transform positional setting of the camera game object. The player game object could be continuously moving through three-dimensional space, which means that this code will ensure that the camera object's Transform settings will update dynamically because this code will be called once per frame. So the camera follows the player object, as it were, and films the player game object from a predefined distance stored in the offset vector. We have defined the offset variable as a 3D vector. So we can set the values for the offset value within the Unity editor. Because it is a public variable, it has a public access modifier. So let's do that. Notice how we have a text box for each dimension of the offset vector available for us to change within the Unity Editor. So we can play around through the Unity Editor with the camera's offset position relative to the player object. This offset value determines the distance from the player game object at which the camera will follow the player game object. We can adjust the x, y, and z values that represent the offset three-dimensional vector field within the Unity Editor until we are satisfied with the user experience, resulting from the camera following the player object at a predefined distance. This predefined distance is saved to the offset public field made of X, Y, and Z values.
So now let's make our player game object jump. So next, let's open the script that we named player movement. Let's add this code within the update method so that when the user presses the J key on the user's keyboard, that a force is applied to the Y axis of the player object, causing the player to jump. So we can do this by appropriately adjusting the velocity property on the rigid body component. So let's create a public variable of type float like this, and let's name this variable jump force. We are making this variable public, of course, so that we can play around with the jump force value through the Unity editor. The jump force value will basically determine how high the player jumps. So let's include code within the update method so that when the user presses the J key, the jump force is applied to the player game object. This is done through an appropriate update to the rigid body components velocity property. Vector.up means the force is applied on the Y axis of the player game object, causing the player's upward velocity to update appropriately, which in effect makes the player object jump. So let's go into the Unity editor and modify the player object's jump force property. And let's test out what happens when we run the game. Okay, so the upward force is being applied to the player game object. But the problem is, at the moment, the user is able to continuously apply a jump force even when the player game object is airborne, as it were. In this game, we don't want our player to be a superhero. So we don't want our player to be able to fly like this. We want our player to jump off the ground once and then subsequently land on the ground, much like what happens when a human jumps in the real world. We don't want the player jumping while in the air, and we want the player to only jump from the ground plane. So the player can only jump from the ground plane and not while in the air. We can achieve this in code by using Unity's onCollisionStay event handler method with the help of a Boolean variable. Please navigate to this URL to learn more about Unity's onCollisionStay method. So the onCollisionStay event handler method is called once per frame for every collider or rigid body that touches another collider or rigid body. Through implementing the onCollisionStay method, we are able to access information about the relevant collision. So how do we do this? We can use the collision argument passed in from Unity at runtime to the onCollisionStay method. From this argument, we are able to glean information about the collision. For example, which object collided with the object on which our script is attached, in this case, the player game object. We want to know when our player object is on the ground plane after the player has jumped. So let's look at how to do this in code. So we can check the name property of the object with which our player object has collided to see if the player has collided with the ground like this. We are using the name property here, but you'll see later in this course why it is often better to use the tag property for this purpose. For now it works for us, so we'll just use the name property. So we want to set the boolean value, we can appropriately name this boolean value off ground, to false when the player object hits the ground after a jump. This basically means that if our code knows, as it were, that the player is back on the ground, when the user subsequently presses the J key, our code can fire to make the player object jump off the ground. While the player object is in the air, i.e. off the ground, and if the user presses the J key, we don't want an upward force being exerted on the player object. So within the update method, we also want to check the off-ground boolean value to make sure that it is false, i.e. is on the ground, before a force can be applied to the rigid body in order to make the player game object jump. So let's test the code. So as mentioned in the previous part of this course, Unity's fixed update method is recommended for handling physics-related code. 
rather than the update method. Very basically, the fixed update method is called with the same frequency as the physics system. So fixed update is more aligned with physics than the update method. The update method is called on every frame. For example, if the game is running at 60 FPS frames per second, the update method is called 60 times per second. If the game is running at 30 FPS, 30 frames per second, the update method is called 30 times within one second of time. So fundamentally, the difference between the update and the fixed update method is the frequency with which it is called. The frequency with which the fixed update method is called is more aligned to Unity's physics engine. So it makes sense that physics related code should be included within the fixed update method rather than the update method. That was just a basic explanation of the significance of the fixed update method. If you want to read more detail about the fixed update method, please navigate to this URL. Excellent! So in the next part of this course, we are going to design our first level so that obstacles are included on the ground plane on the first level of our game. One of the objectives of the game is for the player to avoid these obstacles while attempting to finish a level as fast as possible. So part of the challenge of this game is for the user to control the player game object to avoid these obstacles positioned on the ground plane at various locations in three-dimensional space. We have now created code whereby the user can control the player to move around the obstacles on the ground plane, as well as jump over the obstacles on the ground plane. So join me next time where we'll create the obstacles and see how we can drive the player object during a game session to avoid these obstacles. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. Please ring the bell so that you'll be notified of future content. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. If you're feeling generous and you'd like to thank me by buying me a coffee, I've included a link to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage in the description of this video. It will of course be greatly appreciated. I love reading your comments, so please feel free to drop me a comment in the comments section. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you and take care.